Many of you have played Far Cry 4 and 6, and probably said to yourselves, these can't be real places. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? The challenge! But they are. The Far Cry dictators Pagan Min and Anton Castillo are indeed created from the personas of multiple dictators and regimes. However, there was one dictator in real life who outdid both of these fictional villains. Francisco Macias and Gema ruled the young country of Equatorial Guinea for 11 years. He turned the former Spanish colony into a nightmare state that two-thirds of its population fled in terror from. We look at the brutal reign of Francisco Macias. This is Equatorial Guinea. It's a pretty small country in West Africa, a smidge smaller than Massachusetts. It has a little island called Bioko, renamed from the Spanish colonial name Fernando Po. Like most of Africa, it's an impoverished developing nation with a president who's on track to being the longest serving head of state, fourth only to two kings and another African president. Most of the economy is its very new oil industry, displacing fishing and agriculture, namely cocoa. It has a pretty low human rights record, being labeled a predator of press freedom. Of course, it was much worse. Much, much worse. After being traded by the Portuguese as a pit stop to India and Brazil, it became a Spanish colony and their slave trade hub to the Americas. The Spanish wouldn't consider it pacified until the 1920s. The economy revolved around exporting coffee and cocoa grown on plantations, but all of that would change in the 1960s. Colonies like the Congo, Ghana, and Egypt found independence, and the rest of Africa followed suit. Fearing being bogged down in catastrophic colonial wars like France and being pressured by the global community, Spain decided to cut Equatorial Guinea loose and let them elect their own government. They pushed one particular candidate. Francisco Macias Ngema came from the island of Bioko, raised by ethnic Fang tribals of the Asanji clan. His father was a witch doctor slash shaman, after a Catholic primary education, he worked as a servant to Spanish families in Bioko. Non-Christian peers taunted and bullied him over it, starting his hatred for the Spanish. Over time, he took up work as a corrupt court translator, taking bribes in exchange for clear testimony. Within one year, he was promoted to assistant interpreter, to mayor of Mongomo, to minister of public works, to deputy chair of the governing council. By 1968, he was made deputy prime minister in the transitional government and was elected president of Equatorial Guinea. Spanish officials believed that they could turn him into an easy puppet based on his emotional stability, or more accurately, his lack thereof. Every speech he made usually went off topic to decry the Spanish. His entire anti-colonialist, anti-Spanish campaign platform was ironically organized by a lawyer shipped in from Madrid. Throughout his time under the Spanish colonial government, he held deep resentment of them, European cultures, and intellectuals. His election and presidency vented out his prejudice. For the first months after the October 1968 election, most believed he would be a typical African dictator, that all he wanted were kickbacks to his tribe and his family, his rivals exiled or imprisoned, and hefty Swiss bank accounts. They couldn't be less wrong. In February 1969, he visited the town of Bata, where a few local white residents flew Spanish flags. In a fit of rage, he began encouraging the youth wing of his party to pogrom against any white denizens in the street. This caused an almost overnight exodus of Spanish nationals and sped up withdrawals of the civil guard. Over 7,000 Spanish left after Ngema decreed them disarmed and their properties nationalized. This scared off most college-educated and technically trained people. In March, his own foreign minister requested a change of action, the minister was summoned to the presidential palace, where presidential security broke his legs with rifle butts and threw him out a prison window at Macias's order. Ten out of the original twelve cabinet members were killed by the end of the year. A recalled ambassador was executed by being trapped in a vented water barrel for a week. The openings were filled by his fellow ethnic fang and tribesmen, often his own family. He made his nephew, Teodoro, secretary general of the defense ministry, head of prisons, and governor of Bioko. Two out of three members of parliament were imprisoned, exiled, or killed by the security force handpicked by Macias through blood ties. Intellectuals were targeted especially. Macias purposely bankrupted ministries of education, infrastructure, and agriculture. He ordered the execution of any individuals who wore glasses. He banned libraries, newspapers, possession of supplies for the two, and using the word intellectual. By 1978, only 12 technical school graduates remained. He declared himself Grand Master of Education, Science, and Culture. 
Masias ordered the last schools to close its doors in 1974. Masias executed exes of his girlfriends and husbands of women he coveted. On Christmas 1969, Masias executed 150 opponents in a stadium while speakers played Mary Hopkins' Those Were the Days. To reject Western influence, Masias banned the use of Western medicine. The director of the National Bank was executed publicly and the Central Bank was shuttered. By the late 70s, the only regular state employees were the army, police, and secret police. By the end of his reign, half the country had been detained at least once. He regulated religion. By decree, he ordered the Christian liturgy begin by thanking the president for making it possible as the unique miracle. Catholic churches placed his portrait prominently with the slogans, God created Equatorial Guinea thanks to Papa Masias, and without Masias, Equatorial Guinea wouldn't exist. Soon after, he banned all religion. Priests were forced to publicly announce there is no god except for Masias. The cathedral in Bioko became Masias's personal armory adjacent to his main palace. Christian and Spanish names were banned for being un-African, and all people were expected to adopt African names. Masias's mismanagement and corruption led to the complete destruction of the economy. He nationalized all companies and took personal control of the country's cocoa industry. Despite being a coastal country abundant in marine resources, Masias banned fishing. Meanwhile, he blamed Spain for an economic blockade. While Nigerian indentured workers fled the chaos, huge agricultural production laid idle. Masias introduced national forced labor. Each province had to allocate a percentage of the remaining population, including children, to work fields, mines, and construction without compensation. When agriculture failed to pay for his army, Masias kidnapped foreigners for ransom. A West German woman earned him $57,300. He returned a Spanish man for $40,000. The corpse of a Soviet citizen netted him $6,000. When the census demonstrated that an entire fraction of the population fled, Masias ordered the director of statistics to be kept alive, but his hand chopped off and cut into pieces to help him learn to count. Entire cities became ghost towns, and what few inhabitants remained were unable to keep society going. Observers described it apocalyptic. All imports were seized by Masias's cronies. Most shops, plantations, and workshops sat idle. Currency was replaced by the barter system. Every trip abroad, Masias feared the fate of Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah, who fell to a coup while on a state visit. To that, he regularly executed entire political prisons before any trip. Masias isolated Equatorial Guinea from the rest of the world, severely restricting foreign travel and trade. The last generation of civil servants, mostly fellow ethnic Fang, tried to present a petition en masse to relax his isolationist policies in 1976. All 114 signers were immediately arrested and many executed. By the end of the Masias period, 125,000 or 47% of the country had left, and 50,000 by some estimates were killed. By 1978, the World Bank estimated almost half the population of 1960 had fled. One observer called it the Dachau of Africa, Throughout this terror, Masias showed clear signs of mental illness. He had long conversations with dead people. His mood varied violently. His speech made less sense. His hearing deteriorated, leading to every word being shouted. He consumed narcotics in lieu of hearing aids. He moved to his home village with the entire national budget in cash inside a collection of suitcases stored in a hut next to his mansion with the national pharmaceutical stockpile. Using tribal leaders, he had convinced many citizens that he possessed supernatural abilities and collected skills to prove it. His presidential guard stopped being paid in 1979, leading to them scavenging and hunting for food. He sent his first wife and children off to North Korea that year for a surgery. During their trip, his extended family agreed he had to go. Though he was blood, his erratic behavior and obvious mental illness was a clear liability. On August 3rd, 1979, his nephew Teodoro led a coup. During the coup, Masias set the treasury hut afire, while running off with the remaining foreign currency reserve. The family considered putting him in a psychiatric ward, possibly abroad. However, they decided to put him and his inner circle on trial. Francisco Masias Ngema was charged with embezzlement, economic paralysis, and 80,000 counts of murder. The tribunal found him guilty of a few hundred and sentenced him to death. 
Since he had convinced enough citizens of his supernatural powers, Teodoro paid Moroccan mercenaries to carry out the firing squad. He, Teodoro Obiang Ngema Ambassago, is still president to this day, being the second longest serving president. He serves as a subtle reminder of the phrase, it could be much worse. <laughs>